Good morning, church. Welcome to our Easter service. Let's begin our time together with prayer. Holy God, we are grateful that you have raised Christ from the dead, that we might have a new and living hope. Help us rest our, our trust and our hearts completely and entirely in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to, to look into your word now and, and see him more clearly and walk with him more intimately. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke in the 24th chapter. It's the end of the Gospel of Luke. Um, it, we have seen that Jesus was crucified, that he was dead in the tomb, raised from the dead on Sunday morning. And the, the verses immediately preceding the ones we'll read here in a moment are a, an account of the resurrected Jesus come back from the dead and he's walking along with these disciples on the road to Emmaus until they finally recognize him as, as he breaks bread with them. But these two disciples are so astounded that they've seen the resurrected Lord that they run back and tell the rest of the disciples. And when they go back to tell the rest of the disciples that they've seen him, that he's alive, that he's resurrected from the dead, um, th then Jesus appears to all of them. And that's, that's the story we read today. Let's, let's look. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 53. While they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a, a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I touch and see if a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And he gave them a piece of, um, and they gave him a piece of boiled fish and he took it before them and he ate it. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the, the place I want to begin with all of these verses in considering the resurrection of Jesus is verses, verses 44 to 46. Let me read those again and take note that what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the Bible. He's talking about Scripture. So let me read those verses. He said to them, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, by the way, by saying all three of those, Jesus is basically summarizing all of the Bible that they had at the point in, that point in time. Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, that's all the Old Testament. These are the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. They must be fulfilled. Verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it's written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. So Jesus is having one of the last conversations he'll ever have with his disciples on earth. And what does he tell them about? Not angels, not what heaven's going to be like. He just points them back to the Bible. It shows us how important Jesus thinks that the scriptures are, that one of the last things he says to his disciples is go back and look at the Bible again. And it's, it's incredible. And what he says about the Bible is that as you go back and look at the Bible again, read it with fresh eyes and read it understanding that it's all about me. That he's the fulfillment of all of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. He fulfills every bit of scripture. It's really incredible that that resurrected Jesus. He came back from the dead to tell him what? Go read your Bibles. <laughs> it's incredible. And is that true? Does, does Jesus fulfill all of the scriptures? 
He does. What I want you to do is just take this mental exercise with me. We'll take a jog through the Old Testament. Um, If you think back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, the Satan, who is in the form of a serpent, is cursed there because he has caused, uh, he's tempted mankind to fall to, into sin. And the curse that's issued there to Satan from God is that one of the, the offspring of Adam and Eve, one of their descendants, he says, Satan, you're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. He's going to crush your head. And who is that skull-crushing Savior? Jesus! They're in the first pages of the Bible, right? Fast forward, Genesis 22, Abraham is asked to do something really bizarre, and that is to sacrifice his only son, the heir of his of everything that he has, God tells Abraham, I want you to go up on this mountain and I want you to sacrifice your son as a burnt offering to me. And so he takes Isaac up this mountain. He binds him up, lifts up the knife to kill him. And then an angel of the Lord stops him and says, don't, God will provide the sacrifice. And all of a sudden there's this ram caught in the thicket and they get the ram and they they sacrifice the ram instead. Just imagine Isaac and Abraham walking back down the mountain that day. They're looking at each other going, golly, what just happened there? What was that about? The answer was about Jesus. It was about Jesus, how God would, on that same mountain, many generations later, sacrifice his only son. Jesus is the fulfillment of that event. But you don't understand that unless you're reading it through the lens of Christ. Let's go to Exodus chapter 12. You think of what happens in Exodus 12, God institutes the Passover. And what is the point of the Passover? Well, you come together as a family and you sacrifice a lamb and you take the blood of that lamb and put it on your doorpost so that when the angel of death comes through the the, the land of Egypt to kill everything, it'll pass over your door because the blood of the lamb is on the door again. If you're not looking at it through the lens of Jesus, you're sitting here going, my goodness, why does God want us to put animal blood on our doors. Here's why. It's about Jesus, the Lamb of God. It's his blood that covers us and causes death and sin to pass over us. Let's go to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21, there's this occasion where the Israelites are grumbling against God, and so God sends snakes out to bite them all. Again, I mean, if you're just reading through the Bible, you're thinking, golly, there's a lot of weird things that happen in the Bible here, right? All these snakes in Numbers 21 come out and bite all the Israelites, poisonous. People begin to die from the poison of the snakes, and they cry out to God, and God says to Moses, go out and make a bronze serpent and lift it up on a pole, and when people look at that serpent, then they'll be healed and they'll live. And you're going, a serpent lifted up on a pole? What's that about? It's about Jesus. We told in the Gospel of John that Jesus is the one who is lifted up. Only he's lifted up on a cross so that when we look to him by faith, we'll be healed, we'll live, we'll be saved. Joshua chapter 2, there's an occasion where the Israelites are about to come into the land of Canaan, or they should be about to come into the land of Canaan to take it over, but before they do, they send these spies to go in to Jericho. And while they're in Jericho, they're almost caught, but they uh, they take shelter in a, uh, a woman's house. And as a, a, as a way to sort of repay this woman, the spies tell her that if she will hang a scarlet cloth, out, a scarlet rope out of her window, then when the Israelites come to destroy the city, then her family will be spared. What is that about? Is that just a story about some woman getting saved? No, it's a story about Jesus. He is the scarlet rope that hangs on our lives to spare us from the destruction of our sin and of death. We look into 2 Samuel chapter 7, David's throne. God promises David, David, you will always, forever, is the word that's used, you will forever have a descendant of your own issue who will sit on the throne of Israel forever. Who is that king that will sit on the throne of Israel forever? It's Jesus. The promise to David is about Jesus. 
Or go to Job chapter 9. We've, we've been in the middle of a sermon series about Job, and we saw this incredible chapter, Job chapter 9, where Job is crying out, if only there was someone who could lay their hand on me and lay their hand on God, who could be the mediator between the two of us. And who is that that Job's crying out for? He's crying out for Christ, for Jesus. What about Psalm 2, where the Holy Spirit speaks through the psalmist to say this in Psalm 2, you are my son, today I have begotten you. What's that about? It's about Jesus. How about Isaiah 53, verse 5? All of Isaiah 53 is incredible in how accurately it portrays the crucifixion of, guess who? Jesus. Who else could these words be about? Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. Isaiah wrote this hundreds of years before Christ, and yet he refers so accurately to the significance of Christ's own crucifixion. And then, finally, these verses that Jesus quotes in in our Luke Um, our Luke text here, that the Messiah would be crucified and then three days later be raised according to the scriptures. Well, what scripture is it? Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 say this, come let us return to the Lord for he has, uh, uh, for he has us, but he will, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Hosea is talking about Jesus. And these are just a few of the examples. The pages of the scriptures are dripping with Christ. They're all about him. In fact, we could go so far as to say that unless you understand that everything in this book is about Jesus, you'll never understand anything in this book. It's all about him. We can't understand the scriptures without understanding that they're about Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is why it's said, the Bible tells us that there is a veil over the eyes of the unbelieving Jews. They still just read the the scriptures as though they have a veil over their face. They don't see the whole point of it all. So we, we must understand that Jesus is the point of the Bible, but I also think that we won't understand Jesus unless we read the Bible. These are his words. Remember, he points his disciples back to the Bible on the day, the day he's resurrected from the dead and he's speaking to them, all right, Jesus, what do you want us to do? Go back and look at the scriptures. We won't understand Jesus unless we are in the word of God. I think a lot of the time people will say, you know, I, I just, I, I, you get to a point in life where you say, my, my, my relationship with Jesus just isn't what it used to be. I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I can't hear from him anymore. My first question is going to be this, how often are you in your Bible? How, how, how much time do you spend every day reading God's Word, pouring over the Scriptures? See, people may say, well, you know, I, I just can't believe that I can't understand God unless I read the Scriptures. I don't have time. Let me tell you this. You don't have time not to read the Bible. It's the only way that we can hear from, from God. It, if we think about a relationship, we say, well, I pray, I pray, so, you know, shouldn't I? But if a relationship is two ways, right? We can pray, we can offer our our voice to God, and he will hear us every time when we come in the name of Christ. That's true. But how do we hear back from God? But in his own word. These, these are the words of God for our lives, and these are the very words that Jesus points his disciples back to. Now, I, I think that there's one more uh, major, major move I want to make here, um, not just understanding the scripture, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and Christ himself help us understand more about our own lives. Let me show you what I mean. Think about these disciples who are in this room with resurrected Jesus, come back from the dead. Their progression of understanding who he is has really changed if you know the, the story of their lives. Think about it. When Jesus first began his ministry, or right before he began his ministry, nobody knew who he was. And none of these people that are in the room with him now did. They, they just thought, well, Jesus is some dude. Well, why would I follow him? And it remained that way until John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then all of a sudden, they began to follow Jesus. 
They, but they, they still didn't fully understand who he was. They thought, okay, John thinks this guy's something special, so we'll follow him. And they called him teacher, and they called him rabbi, because, well, he was those things to him. In fact, if you look into Jesus' teaching, particularly like the Sermon on the Mount, he was very rabbinic, very, very much what you would expect from a Jewish rabbi. He'd say things like, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And then he goes on to explain what that means. You have heard, said that you shall not commit murder. And he goes on to explain what that means. He's picking up the commandments from the Old Testament and explaining them. That's what a rabbi does. And so they thought, okay, well, we're just following around this pretty cool rabbi. And that, hap- that was the same until Jesus began to perform these miracles, like making blind people see and lame people walk. And then he, then he would calm the storm by simply speaking to it. And then he would walk on the water. And they're thinking, oh my goodness, this is somebody way more than just a teacher, just a, a rabbi. This must be a prophet. And then they're really excited. They're thinking, all right, there's a prophet in Israel and we get to follow him around. We get to be his disciples. Um, and, and they continued to think that Jesus was just this, this prophet in Israel until Peter, James, and John were taken up onto a mountain. Now here's another progression in their understanding. They were taken up onto a mountain with Jesus, and there Jesus was transformed. And all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah were standing with him, and they're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, this is something even more than a prophet. And indeed, the voice of God said, this is my son. Listen to him. And so at that point, Peter made this confession, you are the Christ, and he was right. Peter was right that that Jesus is the Christ, which means the anointed one, But, but, but the problem is that the Christ they thought he was wasn't who he came, wasn't who he was. They thought Jesus was this Christ that was going to ride into the Jerusalem and and kick out the Romans, to become this political figure. In fact, the day of um, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, they waved these palm branches and he rode in on a donkey. These are all symbols for a victorious conqueror coming home. And they were shouting Hosanna, which means save now. The, essentially, everybody around Jesus thought he was the Messiah at that point, but they thought that he was coming to save them right now, that, that they were going to kick out the Romans and, and take Jerusalem back. So they, they confessed that he was Christ. They said, you're the Messiah at this point. But they didn't completely understand what that meant. And the truth is, they didn't understand what that meant until this moment that we're reading about here. Even when Jesus was hanging on the cross, there was some speculation. Oh, he must be calling out to Moses. Let's wait and see if angels come down to rescue him. They thought that he was this political Messiah up until the moment that he died. And when he died, they weren't sure what he was. They weren't sure what he was until he appeared here. And he says, it's me. I'm not a spirit. Look at my hands and my feet. Touch and see. It's interesting to think about the disciples' progression of their understanding of Jesus because this progression occurs in each one of us. At some point, we probably just thought Jesus was some dude. Um, In fact, there are a lot of people in the world, maybe most people in the world, who think that now. Yeah, Jesus, yeah, he's just some, some dude that the Christians talk a lot about. Some people think that Jesus was uh, a teacher, a rabbi, and, they, and you'll hear them say things like this, oh yeah, I don't know if I believe all of what Christianity says, but I do believe that Jesus was a good teacher. Have you heard people say that? He taught good things. Then there are some people who believe that, that Jesus is a prophet. In fact, this is the official stance of Islam. The Muslim people believe that Jesus was a prophet of God. But as Christians, we believe and we affirm and we say that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. But here's my question. Do we really understand what that means? I think often, often we think of Jesus as the Christ in the same way that the disciples did before he was, appeared to them as resurrected Lord. We think, Jesus died for me. We even say that a lot. Jesus died for me, and that's true, but this is where our emphasis tends to end. Jesus died for me. And then, so we get a little upset when we think, well, how come Jesus hasn't healed somebody for me? How come, how come I didn't, Jesus didn't get that job for me? How come Jesus didn't, didn't make life easier for me? Right? We think that Jesus is this Messiah for me. But 
What's important to understand about seeing Jesus as the resurrected Lord is that he didn't just die for you. He was raised from the dead so that you could live and die for him. For him. I'm going to take you to another place in Scripture. Amazing couple, two little verses in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Listen to what what they say about who Jesus is. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Right? If you have your own Bibles, you want to underline that. For him, all things, it says, everything is created for him. For him. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Amazing. Everything is for him. And I think we see that in this story. There's this light bulb moment for the disciples. Look at verses 45, starting in verse 45, back in Luke. Luke 24 and verse 45, the light bulb moment. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. Right? Finally, they're beginning to get it. They're beginning to see. So when we, be, when we behold the resurrected Christ, we have this same sort of light bulb moment. We see him not just, oh, this is the Christ who came for me, but this is the Christ who came so that I could be for him. No longer are these guys, are these guys tax collectors and fishermen and farmers. They're witnesses. You see that if you, as you go into verse 48. He says, you are witnesses of these things. Now our lives are no longer about our lives. They're about being a witness to him. And, and this, when we finally see resurrected Jesus as the resurrected Christ that our whole lives are for, we begin to see this thing, and, and indeed we begin to see our whole life as being for and about him. I think people will often find themselves sort of frustrated and, and, and disappointed with various aspects of their lives. Maybe you're sitting there listening today and you, you're in that camp. You're frustrated, you're exasperated, you're disappointed about uh, any number of things. Often, I think, it's because of our thinking and the way we think about our lives as Christians. We think about them, unfortunately, naturally, um, from a self-centered perspective instead of a Christ-centered perspective. Instead of, instead of sort of asking the questions, the right questions about our life, like, well, what's going to make my kids happy? How many of us have ever asked that? But really isn't the better question, how can, I, how can I teach my children to love Christ because they are for Him? Or, or when we're thinking about money, we often will think about questions like this, will I have enough money for retirement? But maybe the better question, definitely the better question would be, how can I use the money that I do have to advance the kingdom of Christ? Because our money exists, what? For Him. You see that? So often we worry about so many things, ultimately even things like death, and we think, oh my goodness, what if I die? Well, the better question is this, what if you spend your whole life and never live for Christ? Right? Don't worry about if you're going to die, worry about if you're going to live, if you're going to live for Him. This becomes the better question. And and when we begin to see Christ, not just as the, the Messiah who came to hang on a cross for us, but the one who was resurrected from the dead so that we could be for him, then we begin to realize that our life is not about, that life is not about you. It's about him. Only in him do we find the joy that we're really looking for our whole lives. Let me show you in these last couple of verses, verses 50 to 53. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And and after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They finally found the joy that they were searching for in the resurrected Christ. Then verse 53, and they were continually in the temple praising him. 
The joy that you're looking for is in Christ Jesus in being continually living a life that is worshiping him, that is trying to find meaning and significance in him, in him. Today, this Easter Sunday, I pray that you will find that joy. For Christ is risen. And in him there is great joy when we live our lives for him. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen.